I'm going to talk today about collaborative AR and VR. And my lab um, over the past years has been particularly concentrated on user interfaces for AR and VR. I'm showing you just a couple of images of some of the things we've done in the past, uh, which I've mentioned a little bit more detail in previous talks that I've given here. Um, but one way to think about what we do is that we have an emphasis on trying to build effective user interfaces. So the question that we ask that drives the work that my lab does is how can AR and VR help people accomplish their goals more effectively, whether they're working individually or together? And what I'm going to talk about today is the together part, the idea of people collaborating with each other in augmented reality and or virtual reality. Now, uh, last year, I talked in a little bit of detail about a particular example of this. I'm not going to go into that kind of detail now. I'll just mention it in passing. And that's a work on remote task assistance. And one of the important things here is remote task assistance means multiple people working together. And one of the really cool things, I think, about the time that we're at right now is that the technology has gotten sufficiently inexpensive that we're in a situation in which you can have when you're in a research lab or you're in a company trying to get a handle on how things are going to play out, you can have multiple people in AR or VR. There was a time 50 years ago, literally 50 years in one month, which is the uh, publication of the first AR and VR paper by Ivan Sutherland at the Full Joint Computer Conference in 1968. We're officially in the, the second half of the first century of AR and VR. But there was a time back then in which it took literally an entire room to be able to go and do AR and VR. Um, we have obviously way past that right now. But we are now at the point at which a 12-year-old kid uh, could have gotten for the past holiday season or the one before that for not too many hundreds of dollars the VR head-worn display that would let them essentially experience VR in a way far better than a person would have been able to do it as a researcher not too many years ago because the technology has gotten sufficiently inexpensive and good. And two of those 12-year-olds could get together in one of their basements, and now they have a collaborative system in which they can actually work together. And so in this work that we talked about uh, last year, um, we were looking at this idea of remote task assistance in which a remote uh, expert could assist a local technician. The local technician was working in AR, seeing the real world. The remote technician was working in VR, seeing things that were purely virtual, but which corresponded to the things in the real world. In industry, people often talk about the idea of a digital twin. And that's what we had over here, a virtual reality version of all of the track components in a particular task domain where the remote person could actually show the local technician how to perform some task that the local technician didn't know how to do, and which maybe all the recorded documentation didn't know how to do. So I'm going to talk about a different um, uh, domain right now. Um, and to introduce that, how many people here know what we're looking at? So what is this? Ah, OK. Now, if you look a little bit more carefully, does this look like a picture you've seen of Manhattan before? It looks a little odd, right? Does anyone really know what this is? Yes? OK, this is not a, this is, OK, this is a data set, but it's a physical data set. What you're looking at here is still to this day, over 50 years later, the world's largest scale model of a real city. This is built for the New York World Fair in 1964, built in the early 60s. Uh, by Robert Moses, uh, known as the master builder of uh, New York. And the idea was to do two things. One is to give fair goers this amazing experience of being able to see this huge model that had every single building in the entire city actually in it. Okay? Now, that cost a lot of money and took a lot of time. And the World Fair did not last all that long. So why was he doing this? Well, the idea was when the fair was over, this was a real city. That was his city. It was in his city, nearly 100 feet on his side in what is now the Queen's Museum. Back then, it was a New York City uh, pavilion at the fair. And the idea was that he was in charge of planning the fate of the city. And you could have people standing around this thing pointing at it with a flashlight, there were no laser pointers back then, and saying, well, what if we put a bridge over here? You could actually see things in context. Okay? 
you can think of this as being a little bit like not a digital twin of a city, because it wasn't digital, but kind of like a scale model twin in which you'd be able to go and make decisions about stuff in the context of actually seeing it. Okay? So this is 1960s technology. I mean, you might say, well, why didn't they use a computer? Well, there were no computers that did this kind of stuff back then. This is years before that 1968 Sutherland paper, which was at the same conference of, at, as the what's so-called mother of all demos that Doug Engelbart gave with his group showing off video conferencing and multiple windows on a display at the same time and text that you'd actually edit and would be human words rather than scientific stuff. So, you know, computers were not an option back then. However, computers are an option right now. And so one of the things I've been interested in, my lab has been interested in, is how can we take something like this, which you can still see to this day, which is this big model that they try to update, but that's kind of like a thankless task if you, you want to have every single building in the city, and how can we make this essentially be something that's digital? And so what we're seeing over here, basically, is a uh, kind of technology demonstration of being able to do this sort of thing. Um, we're using um, uh, building models from uh, world.com. Um, and uh, here we have two people, both using the same technology that any 12 or 13-year-old kid who was really into VR and AR and saved up their allowance or got their parents to go and spend for a holiday present would actually have. Um, and we can do something, however, that that physical model didn't have is we can put virtual stuff in it. And so what you're seeing over here, for example, these little stacks of, of little uh, placards are actually uh, gotten live. They are records from New York City Open Data. New York is one of many cities that has a lot of stuff uh, online which you can access. Open Data means open, literally for free. Um, these happen to be records of 311 calls. Uh, 311 is the number that you call in New York and many other cities if you have a non-emergency problem, potholes, people making noise, that kind of thing. Um, and when you make the call, there's a person there who answers it and essentially types stuff into a computer, and now that stuff actually can be accessed by anyone. And in this case, they're all georeferenced, so we can grab hold of these things and put them in the place in which they actually uh, were talking about. So let's see what this actually looks like. So this is a, uh, a Rift version of it. So here is a uh, 311 record, and we can look at it, and we can scroll through these things, and we can you know, get, get an idea of the, the kinds of things that are happening in a particular place, for example. And we have another person who we can, we can work with to be able to collaboratively explore this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a tweet, for example. So this is all in VR over here. Um, what about AR? Well, an advantage of AR is you can actually see the other person. You can see the context that you're in. And there's many different ways in which actually being there and being aware of the place that you are in can be really important. So let me show you an example of this in, in AR. This is what's called video see-through AR. This is being done with a Vive uh, Pro which has a pair of relatively low-res VGA-res cameras on the front. And what I'm going to show you here um, is basically a little bit of interaction with a way of communicating with that other person, who you can see actually standing up in the background over there a little bit dimly. Um, and the idea here is that you have a, a kind of bulletin board. You're seeing uh, a little bit of on the right over here. And if I start this playing, what's happening is as we look around, we can see a bunch of different things. There's some Yelp records over here. We're at the Upper West Side. Uh, there's a popular restaurant. We can grab hold of it, and we can basically make a little cloned copy on that board. And that board is shared between the people who are working together. You can be talking with them, obviously, gesturing at things. And then you could be making some decisions. Maybe this is a cluster of good restaurants. I can move them around, obviously, the same way that I would with Post-it notes. Uh, maybe there is a, uh, a relevant uh, complaint. Maybe it's a complaint about uh, sanitation or something that might be relevant to those restaurants. So the idea is that you can work together with another person and do stuff. And the cool thing here is that this is not something that took up literally the, an entire building and took millions of dollars and years to make. This is just the technology that two kids who are kind of into cool VR stuff might be able to play with in their basement right now. 
So this means not only could you use something like this for uh, urban planning, uh, urban design, uh, first responders, but it also means that someone who simply had a system at home, and those systems, as we know, are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, could use this to figure out, what am I going to do on the weekend? What's a cool part of the city to visit? Hmm, I'm thinking of moving into a new apartment. Let's look around. That building looks kind of nice. You know, maybe I want to go there. Hmm, let's see what's, oh, oh, there's a complaint about rats. Uh, and there's a rest, another complaint about rats. Maybe I don't want to live in that building. So the point is that you can use something like this in a more fleshed out form for a whole bunch of different things that are not the serious things, but the kind of things that you know, people just do on a relatively daily basis, as well as those really more serious applications. So let me talk about another example. This one is going to be purely VR right now, at least to what I'm showing you. And this is an example of a collaborative uh, motor rehabilitation. So the idea here is that um, there are people who go to a therapist, for example, uh, because they have certain kinds of motor problems. Um, it takes time to get there, or the therapist might even come to them. That all takes time, and that time might even be longer than the time it takes to actually be in a therapeutic session. So a lot of people have worked on doing VR uh, games um, for therapy. That's a very uh, important, I think, industry. Um, and what we're doing over here is trying to see what happens if another part of the technology, not so much the VR AR part, but what if the communication gets a lot better than it is. So the work I'm going to show you um, was done uh, for and with Verizon. They had come to us asking if we could do something that would show off the uh, neat things you can do with 5G. 5G has uh, faster throughput. It also has a lot lower latency. So we wanted to concentrate on latency and to come up with something that was just not going to work well under 4G. And so what we have over here is um, a virtual environment with two people who are actually not co-located. You can see the hands of one person and you can see the ropes going up to the hands of another person over there. And the idea is that we have a very simple world. We have for each person, a pair of virtual handles attached to a pair of elastic virtual ropes attached to a uh, kind of marble textured looking virtual platform on which there is a virtual ball. And now with two people, not in the same place, holding those ropes, if it were physical, well, what are you going to do? Let's keep the ball from rolling off. Let's move it around. Let's be really careful. Don't let it fall off. Once we get good at that, let's see if we can bounce it up in the air and actually make it do kind of more fun things, OK? Um, it turns out if you do that with the tens of milliseconds of delay that you would have in 4G, one person, let's say, says three, two, one, bounce, and the next and starts pulling up their end. The next person, the other person, Here's that 40, 50 milliseconds later. And instead of the platform going up like this, it's going to go up like that. The ball goes who knows where, right? Um, so what does this look like? So the idea is these are people, myself included, who have had a little bit of practice with this. It takes time to go and get to do this. But the point is that if you have this under, in this case, 15 milliseconds is around the limit above which if you try this and you get 15 milliseconds of, of latency, you're going to not be able to do it well, and you're going to know it's not your fault and it's not the other person's fault. It's the system. When you get below that, in this case, a single digit number of milliseconds of latency, um, if you drop the ball, you feel that it's your fault or the other person's fault. You don't really think of the system as being an issue over there. Um, so way of collaboration, we're talking about collaboration, this notion of being able to have really good, low, really low latency between what people do is really important for a number of domains in which you need to interact in that very, very intimate kind of way. So I've talked a bit about collaboration in AR and VR, emphasis on the user interfaces. Um, and what I want to mention is that if you're interested and you actually develop AR and VR software, um, we have a framework that was used to develop all the things that I just showed you called Mercury Messaging Framework. It makes it possible for um, different parts of the scene graph in Unity to be able to collaborate, communicate with each other, do that within a single machine and across multiple machines. Um, it is uh, open 
and available um, at GitHub at the URL that I have at the top over there. We encourage you to download it. Um, it takes care of the networking. It takes care of making things be really efficient and easy to write, much easier than writing custom code to communicate between ar arbitrary parts of the scene graph. And so at this point, I want to acknowledge the many folks and funding agencies, put up the URL again at the top over there, and uh, say thank you. <laughs>